Physical inactivity is a disease state. We've been fighting an obesity epidemic for the last 50 years. Have we gotten anywhere? Maybe it's not just a fat problem. Maybe on the flip side of the coin, it's a muscle problem because it's actually a metabolic problem. And at the root is skeletal muscle. This is the new treatment for hypertension. This is the new treatment for dementia. This is the new treatment for cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, I will not be asking you to do high knees. <laughs> and this is probably the only group that would find that disappointing. <laughs> My fittest group here. CrossFit changed the game of fitness. Do you agree? I heard you guys were interactive. Changed what we thought fitness could look like. In the beginning, it started humbly. Maybe in a garage, I don't actually know. But I can guarantee you, it took time to catch wind and take off. And in the beginning, people probably were like, what is this? Maybe they thought, this is crazy. I'm going to go back to jazzercise. But they didn't. And because they didn't, the landscape of health and fitness has changed. Now, what happens when we have a mission? A mission starts with a, a vision, a message, and messengers. CrossFit is that vehicle. And muscle-centric medicine is starting from a humble beginning. So what I'm going to ask of you is to open your mind, to take a step back, and we're going to rethink health and wellness. These are my disclosures. So the framework for understanding for all of health and wellness is truly twofold. There is the mental, and then there is the physical. The mental, they only gave me 30 minutes, I can't talk to you about that. But I will tell you, the one key to longevity is simple, and that's discipline. The physical game seems to be a little more challenging. And every week, we have new information coming out. And every week, the science is confusing, and we have one expert over here saying one thing, and one influence over here saying another. And quite frankly, it divides us. It doesn't unify us. And at the foundation of muscle-centric medicine, and what I'm going to talk to you about is how do we come up with a unifying language? If we do not have something as unifying, and we cannot speak about something with common terms, we have no chance of changing the future. What we can agree upon, health is important. I'm sure you all agree upon that. What we disagree upon is nearly everything. <laughs> this side of the room says fasting is good. This side of the room says, I don't know, go vegetarian, go vegan, carnivores are in the middle. I just cannot believe that we have not imploded yet. We're not getting anywhere. We are sicker, we are more overweight than before. You know, I have to tell you, where did this come from? I think every movement has a story behind it, right? Otherwise, it's not a movement. It's just something that we do, it lives and it dies. And, you know, I just noticed the timer is not going. If you get me started, you will not stop me. So I did my fellowship in geriatrics and nutritional sciences, and I did it at WashU. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that program, but it Woo! is. Yes! <laughs> and I did not drop my mic in the back. Um, very vigorous. And for those of you who have done geriatrics or end of life or aging, you will know that it is pretty morbid. I know that there are 36 physicians in this room. Raise your hand. Holy. Cow, maybe more than 36. You guys have all seen end of life. This is a very fit physician. I am talking to my people. It changed you, didn't it? it? Takes one person to die in front of you, 
and you think about their family, and you think about what they could have done different. You know, when I was doing geriatric research, geriatrics and nutritional sciences, I had one participant. I had one study participant. We all have the one person, the one person that changes everything for us, whether it's a client, Tommy, I see you over there, I see you, whether it's a client, whether it is a patient, whether it is a whoever it is, maybe you're training them. And it changes the trajectory of how you think about it. And that one person for me, she was a woman, she's in her mid-50s, mom of three, her name was Betsy. She had done what everybody had told her to do, what was going to work for her obesity problem. She was struggled with the same 20, 30 pounds, as always. Many of us know the same person. She did her zone two cardio, she restricted her calories, she followed the food guide pyramid, and she did this over and over and over and over again. We imaged her brain, and her brain looked like the beginning of an Alzheimer's brain. I said to you that at the beginning, every movement, movement starts with a meaning and a message. And I vowed to myself, I never told her she should have lifted weights that she should have trained, that we think that this obesity epidemic is some nebulous thing, that hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's just happens. We failed her. The medical community had failed her, and I promised I would not fail another person. So for all you physicians in the room, and all you trainers, and all you coaches, that's what we're really doing. So, the fat-phobic perspective is all symptomology. We've been fighting an obesity epidemic for the last 50 years. Have we gotten anywhere? Not only that, we're worse. You tell me one problem that you can fix if you ask the wrong question. So if you get the question wrong, are you going to ever fix that problem? Anybody? Never. So perhaps it's not about being fat-focused. Obesity is a symptom. It's a symptom of unhealthy muscle. I am talking to the group that knows this the best. Switching to muscle-centric medicine, it's all about muscle mass, which, by the way, Tommy, I'm going to call you out again, we have not been measuring directly, and hopefully we're going to get better at that. All, it is about protein. I don't care what you guys are hearing. Effortful training and looking at the root cause. So I wanted, I've been thinking a lot about this. This is what I do in my spare time. My husband is in the back. This is what he hears about all the time. And uh, everybody blames overweight and obesity to the problems as if it's the root cause. So I was thinking, okay, so if that's true, come with me here. So if 70% of adults are either overweight or obese, and overweight and obesity is the cause of diabetes, then wouldn't 100% of those people be diabetic? Does anyone ever think about that? How come only 30%? So maybe it's not just a fat problem. Maybe on the flip side of the coin, it's a muscle problem because it's actually a metabolic problem. And at the root is skeletal muscle. Just going to drop that on the floor for you. <laughs> See, the thing about humans is we're funny. We hear something over and over again enough, we accept it to be true, even if it's not. So my challenge is, how do we think differently? And then I was thinking, let me look at the number, let me look at the causes of death, what the CDC says the causes of death are. They're right there for you heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury. I would like someone to show me where sarcopenia and obesity are on that list. I'll wait. So the current state of affairs is obvious. I already told you 70% are either overweight or obese. And then we think about physical inactivity as this, this state, the state of being, and that this and by the way, um, if you guys do not know who Bente Peterson is, uh, Peterson, she's at Copenhagen, she's incredible, and she's really pioneered this idea of muscle 
as an organ, muscle as an organ system. And I say that because I'm going to make a very important point on this slide. Um, and we think about this physical inactivity as the flip side of activity. So there's physical activity, and then it's physical inactivity as if that's kind of the opposite. Physical inactivity is a disease state. There is no such thing as a healthy, sedentary person. It doesn't exist. So if you go back and you look at the literature, you will see papers that say healthy, sedentary individuals. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. Skeletal muscle is the organ of longevity. Inactive skeletal muscle isn't that it's just inactive. Skeletal muscle secretes things like myokines, it's, which interleukin-6, which you think of as an inflammatory cytokine, when it comes from skeletal muscle, does very specific things, like affects and improves the immune response, like affects and improves low-grade inflammation, like affects and improves brain function, arterial health. So it's not just physical inactivity is just kind of this thing. It's a diseased state. So we keep looking for solutions. This is the new treatment for hypertension. This is the new treatment for dementia. This is the new treatment for cardiovascular disease. Why are we not coming back to the foundation? Why are we constantly looking out there instead of looking at what we already know? All right, my talk is over. I think I've laid it out for you. I'm just kidding. Um, so, and then I got to thinking, you know, this thing with Betsy, how I had screwed up and all the physicians I know had screwed up because these things were not talked about. And then I realized we're not over fat. We don't have an obesity epidemic. What we really have is a midlife muscle crisis and that the skeletal muscle problem starts decades earlier, just like the diseases of aging. When does cardiovascular disease start? Doc, doc, doc. When does it start? 30, 20s, 30s. What about, I don't know, dementia, Alzheimer's. Tommy, when does dementia and Alzheimer's probably begin? Oh, really? What about sarcopenia? When do you guys think that that begins? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> But let's just say, for argument's sake, maybe 20 or 30. So all of these diseases of aging that we're thinking about as existing out there actually all correlate to the health of skeletal muscle as well and begin around the same time. And that I would argue that the diseases that we're talking about have been so difficult to think about because For the last 30 or so year, years, if not longer, we have not been measuring skeletal muscle mass directly. We've all heard about DEXA, right? This is the gold standard. What does DEXA measure? What? Oh, yes, and fat. And then it extrapolates lean mass or fat-free mass. That's not skeletal muscle mass. So nearly all the literature on sarcopenia is based on DEXA. Yes, we use CT and MRI. This, is not, this does not enable us to use and look at large populations, and it is not available to people. So we have been using DEXA, and because we've been using DEXA and not looking at skeletal muscle mass directly, we have disassociated the importance of not just strength, We all know that strength is important, but actual skeletal muscle mass, the amount that we have. And I'm going to tell you what, mark my words, we are going to be at the precipice of something big. And I put this, pa this paper up here. This is, if you guys are interested, it's called a D3 creatine. Creatine only exists in skeletal muscle. And when we begin to measure skeletal muscle mass directly, guess what we find? We find that reduced skeletal muscle mass is highly associated with important outcomes, like hypertension, like cardiovascular disease, like injury. That has never been thought about before. We've constantly accepted that the DEXA is the gold standard, and because 
It doesn't show a correlation of skeletal muscle mass and outcomes that we care about. It must not be important. It's not true. And in fact, the negative effects of being overweight or overfat were not nearly as important as the loss of skeletal muscle mass. Do you guys understand how important this is? I only see one person smiling, and it's my friend Tommy. <laughs> so, again, now we are going to begin to measure skeletal muscle mass using D3 creatine. It's going to change the game, and it's going to start now. And you're like, why do I care about that? DEXA and bioimpedance are good, but please, it takes, I think, roughly, it's a 10% change in skeletal mass to be actually detectable. So it's some significant amount of detection that actually shows up. So DEXA is not what we need to be looking at. OK, so now I'm going to convince you, <laughs> this group doesn't need much convincing, why muscle is so much more than looking good in a bikini, which, by the way, the next CrossFit for Health Summit, everyone is showing up in a bikini or a mankini or whatever it is that you want to wear. <laughs> uh, but muscle is so much more than that, OK? Muscle is just so much more than that. It is the site for glucose disposal. So all the diseases and all the things that we're talking about with metabolic dysregulation, skeletal muscle is it, OK? It is also the site for lipid oxidation. People care about cholesterol, their lipid numbers, skeletal muscle. It secretes myokines. And this is actually very interesting for the physicians in the room. I've been working very hard to see if there is some apl applicable way to measure myokines. In the US, we are not doing that. And that would be interleukin 10 and interleukin 6. But skeletal muscle secretes these myokines that eventually, I believe, we're going to be able to see the effectiveness of exercise. And of course, it functions as an amino acid reservoir. When you get injured, if you get injured, the reality is, if, is you will. And you will rely, and your survivability will be dependent on how buff you are. My husband's living forever, if that's the case. Just kidding. Uh, OK, where does insulin resistance start? All we hear about is insulin resistance, and uh, where does it start? Where does it start? I heard you guys are interactive. I'm going to sleep up here. It starts in skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the primary site for insulin resistance. Um, you know, and it seems to be very overlooked. It's the, primary it's the primary defect, skeletal muscle insulin resistance. If you care about insulin resistance, if you care about your own health, if you care about your client's health, then you have to address skeletal muscle. And again, an inactive exercise, an inactive human is a disease state. It does, there is no flux in this tissue. This tissue gets sicker. So this is a, a, a CT of a cross-sectional area of a thigh. You can see on the side C, this is a healthy 24-year-old. Do you see that filet if you guys went to dinner last night? <laughs> Everybody is not eating meat tonight. But uh, that's what you want your muscle to look like. And it can always be that way. But so E, you can see E, this is a 66-year-old male who's been very active. And you can see the integrity of the skeletal muscle. There is not an infiltration of fat which when fat infiltrates, and I'm not talking about the athlete's paradox for um, the scholars in the room, when, if you look at the middle, this middle version here, which is probably the average adult is getting around, I mean, 50% of Americans aren't exercising, 70 some percent of those that are exercising are not meeting the requirements for both cardiovascular activity and resistance training, which is why CrossFit changed the game for those that are change the paradigm of exercise. So once fat begins to infiltrate, so D is an obesogenic sarcopenic person. Increase in fat mass, decrease in skeletal muscle mass. That fat that infiltrates into the tissue changes the contractility. It changes its metabolic effects. And guess what? It is completely not inevitable. You do not hit 66 years old or 70 or 80 and all of a sudden you look like a marbled steak. We've been sold stuff that's not true, my friends. This also is not true, and I didn't think about changing it before. So for males, do you know this? 
Do you know men's testosterone does not have to decline? Did you guys know that? I mean, I measured my 74-year-old dad's testosterone, and it was like 900. Right? Women, um, our hormones go. It's just the reality. It was a massive design flaw. Not exactly sure what happened. But, uh, but the thing is, is that there are certain, and, and I really have to rethink this slide. If you guys have looked at some of uh, Brett Goodpasture's work, we think that this aging process is kind of what happens. And you know, for the longest time, I trained under Dr. Donald Lehman. For those of you who know Lane Norton, we trained at the same time. And uh, we were always taught that skeletal muscle changes that happen, there's an increase in insulin resistance, there's a decrease in capillary perfusion, there's all these decrease in protein signaling. And the more that I keep thinking about it, the more that I recognize that we don't have models of aging that are actually like the CrossFitters. We have models of aging that are, I don't know, moderately active humans, which arguably is probably more of a disease state than it is a health state. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So the question is, is, is the research that we're looking at, are we actually looking at disease models or are we looking at optimized models? I, I think that we're looking at disease models. So um, I am going to talk more about these changes with aging because I know that there's a lot of protein distribution questions I'm, not, I'm sure that I'm going to get. So I'm going to give you two answers as we go through this. So guys, you suck for um, keeping your testosterone levels up for that long. Um, so what happens with aging? Oftentimes, and this is a rendition of Doug Patton Jones's catabolic crises model. If you guys have not heard of this, then you should definitely look it up. There's some wonderful literature. And this is actually how we age. Um, and so a catabolic crisis model is basically when an injury, so we don't age linearly. And we all, you know, our parents, our grandparents, it's not as if, um, and you guys can probably all attest to this, someone falls and breaks a hip. Someone gets injured. The older they are, the less they come up to baseline quickly, right? And so it's actually this, this idea of a, a catabolic crisis model. I was looking at some literature yesterday, and an older adult will lose muscle mass from their legs three times faster in one third of the time as an individual's younger counterparts. Three times faster in one third of a time. How do we protect our aging? And the reality is, is we're all doing it, except for me, but the rest of us, we're all doing it. But we're all aging. And so if we were to really think about what are we going to do, we have to understand that, that how do we account for this catabolic crisis? And what we're going to do is we're going to build muscle, and we're going to maintain muscle at all costs. And then the other thing is, obviously, dietary protein is going to be critical. And what happens during these catabolic crises models is then metabolism changes. As you lose skeletal muscle, your ability to blunt inflammation, if, if you believe what I'm selling, which is muscle is the currency of life, then you will believe if you lose it, and you will see the evidence that we see increase in insulin resistance, and we see increase in blood glucose, and we see increase in triglycerides because of loss of skeletal muscle, not because of gain of body fat. And I recognize that I'm saying this in a very black or white way, and I'm not trying to make the physicians in the room cringe here, but the evidence would suggest that this is really a model of thinking about it that is actually evidence-based and very supported by literature. And I will also say, one of the major ways in which we treat people is bed rest. When someone gets sick, what do we do for people? Including myself. We sleep, we go to bed, bed rest. Okay. Muscle. Now we're going to get into the things that you guys all came for, likely, is how do we affect muscle health? Well, quite the obvious, and again, back to the fundamentals. Diet and exercise. Shocking, I know, but the balance between these two changes. And this is where I think CrossFit has just changed the game. You know, 
as you know, when you were younger and you could do whatever and still gain benefit. You're on the Twinkie diet. You're probably lifting like an idiot. You're doing all the other things, but you're still, you're making gains, man. You are making gains. And then all of a sudden you hit like 30 and uh, you're way less jacked, way less tan. And you're like, I do not know what's going on. There is likely some hormonal shifts that happen, um, except for Tommy. Tommy's bicep almost hit me in the face yesterday. You guys know Dr. Tommy Wood? Like literally just knocked me out. Um, so when you're young, you know, we talk about dietary protein and these protein thresholds. When you're young, kids don't have a protein threshold. They can stimulate muscle because they're so driven by hormones that they can get five grams of dietary protein. You know, for the parents in the room, people always ask me, how much protein should my kid have? Well, pretty much how much they'll eat, but also you don't have to worry about dosing it. And I think that the conversation about dosing is definitely changing. Um, and then diet. As you know, again, that's the one thing that 100% of people do here is eat. 100% of people eat. <laughs> Unless there's a new fad that I'm totally missing that is going to slap me in the face, everybody eats. The choice is, what do we eat and how do we behave in ways to protect skeletal muscle? I do not give a crap about obesity. In fact, I don't want to hear anyone in this room, if I know you personally, I don't want to ever hear you say about our obesity epidemic. We have a midlife muscle crisis. What are we going to do that's actually going to support that? And I'm going to tell you it's dietary protein. Um, and the metabolic advantages of protein, regardless of what you're hearing, again, this is a soft sell to you guys because you guys are, you guys are in the CrossFit space, man. You are into working hard. Um, you, are lightly, you are likely ahead of the curve. Dietary protein, there are decades of research that shows that it improves body composition. Protects skeletal muscle, targets fat loss, increases metabolic rate. I have my thoughts on this. I really think that that is a dose-dependent um, ingestion. It enhances satiety. We know this. It can reverse metabolic syndrome. So I worked on, I was telling Rhonda um, before, as, when I was in my undergraduate, which I did with Dr. Don Lehman, I worked for many years, four years, collecting urine, doing all these things, and my, my name never goes on a paper. So these old school academics believe that if you are an undergrad and you are working on a paper, your name does not get to go on, on the paper. But we did some of these early, the early papers about uh, protein, protein dosing and metabolism, and I'm telling you, their metabolic syndrome reversed. Decreased blood pressure, decreased triglycerides, um, decreased fasting blood sugar, you name it. OK, so why do we need protein? Well, we don't actually need protein. Uh, we need the amino acids that ride along with it. And I will have to tell you, we have a very reductionist view of dietary protein. Um, for simplicity's sake, yeah, it just makes up 20 different amino acids. And people will say, well, if you get enough protein, then it doesn't matter where it comes from. And in part, that's absolutely true. It doesn't matter where it comes from if all you care about is protein and short-term benefit. But the question becomes is, you know, it's really about these limiting amino acids. I've listed them there for you. I know that I'm running short on time. But when we think about muscle health, what we're really thinking about are these branch chain amino acids. They must come from food. You have to ingest them. There's no way around it. You can't build muscle without it. And again, I don't have time to talk about this, but I think that we're talking about protein. And you know, protein is not one thing. And it's also the food matrix that rides along with protein. So whether we talk about plant and we talk about animal protein, you know, there's literature that comes out that says, well, um, you can have plant or animal. It doesn't matter as long as you have a high enough protein. Yeah, that's true for protein. But what about creatine? What about B12? What about the other physiological needs that we have? So what is the safe range of dietary protein? We really screwed this one up. Um, so 0.8 grams is the minimum. And I will tell you what the RDA would recommend, which, by the way, hasn't changed since like 1948. Um, so they're really up on it, um, 1968. And then the energy requirements, so they will say 0.8 grams is the minimum to prevent a deficiency. So if I was 115 pounds, 0.8 grams for me would be like 45 grams of protein a day. People think that that's the maximum because it's the RDA hasn't changed in forever. But I think what's more important is, as I think you guys all know this, there has not been an upper limit established. Whether it's three grams of protein per kg, we don't know. It could be 35% of energy calories. 
But what I think that we have to understand and, and what I think is most important is the languaging. What is a high protein diet? Does anyone know? What's a low protein diet? I would say that 0.8 grams per kg would be considered a low protein diet because that's a minimum to prevent a deficiency. But where is our common terminology of these things as we talk about it amongst ourselves? It doesn't exist. So anything, by definition, a 0.8 grams per kg below that would be either insufficient or deficient. And then I would say if you double that, 1.6 grams per kg, that would be a moderate protein diet. Be in the middle. And then potentially a high protein diet or a higher protein diet would be one gram per pound, ideal body weight. Um, no evidence to suggest that you need to go above 1.6 grams, but I do because I think that there's benefit to it. So, so these are the curtain guidelines. And <laughs> just screw those. I don't know if I can swear, but I won't. Um, so let's talk about what Americans actually do. So this is from the NHANES data when they looked at uh, what, what are the patterns of dietary foods. You know, my friend Justin is in, in the, the front row here. I bet you if we were back in Houston, he's part of our, and Greg's here, our, like our training buddies, he probably would have a tiny number five uh, cinnamon roll for breakfast, which will give him a 10 gram of, hi Justin. He's, my kids are his trainer. Um, he pulls them on a sled, they, you know, make him go back and forth. But anyway, 10 grams of protein. So this is what is typically done. So this is, and again, if, there's this whole distribution conversation that people are asking. Does dietary protein distribution matter or is it all about the 24-hour intake? If it was all about the 24-hour intake, then why are we always using the first meal of the day? Because it's easier? I don't know if that's true. So this is the, the, the way in which um, people eat. I think that there is evidence to support a distribution, but not three meals a day. I don't think that this 30 grams three times a day, and I think we're starting to understand why, is actually helpful. But what I do think is helpful is understanding why at least two meals a day to hit a threshold of leucine, which is one of the branched chain amino acids, will be very beneficial. So this came out of, um, originally out of Don's lab. Uh, it was first done in rodents, and then they moved to humans. But this idea of where do we get these dosing? The dosing comes from understanding that this leucine threshold is required to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And that's where you'll get a meal response for humans, for adults. But as individuals age, potentially they need more protein per meal. And again, I'm excited for questions if we get it. But here is what I think is a better way in which we can think about it. So the first meal of the day would be between 30 to 50 grams of protein, but there's no evidence to support that you need protein for a second meal a day. Just the evidence isn't there. Um, one reason for some of the scientists in the room are, is that these initiation factors are still going after that first meal a day. We don't know how long they go for, but arguably before you're going into an overnight fast and you still have to meet your 24-hour protein need, understanding the dosing the first and last meal of higher volumes of protein will be beneficial. So, um, and this is, again, this is a way to do it. I know that there's going to be conversations about there's no upper limit of protein. Uh, that's not true. I, I don't think that that's true or accurate. So how do we determine the needs of muscle? Number one, how many grams per day is, if we think about a protein hierarchy? 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kg. People think that endurance athletes don't need more protein. You do. Strength athletes, you guys can see it. I don't know if these slides will be available. Feel free to message me. I'm happy to to send these to you. So the big picture is your 24-hour need. The bigger picture is grams per meal. And I think the best picture is understanding it's not just about protein. It's about the quality. It's about the quality of these physiological needs that we have. OK, now I don't have a ton of time because I told you all these stories. But let's just talk about carbohydrates. They're not terrible. You guys already know this. Probably doing a million push-ups and doing all these things. It really is about carbohydrate tolerance. The, um, the current RDA is 130 grams. The average uh, individual is getting 300 grams. But you know, as CrossFitters, you guys can probably manage this. It's just the truth. Um, I put this up here for anyone who was curious about how we design nutritional meals. And um, myself and my colleagues believe that there is 
is understanding the rate of appearance of glucose from a meal to compare to the rate of disposal. So basically, that boils down to between 40 and 50 grams of carbohydrates per meal outside of exercise. If you are trying to manage body composition, ultimately, you have to realize that there may be some benefit to regulating the insulin response with calories controlled. Um, again, we see this in clinic. This is how we do it, and it seems to work extraordinarily well. So if you were to want some practical information about what you're going to do, carbohydrates, again, I will say 130 grams. You don't need that much. You get by on 100, 100 grams. Uh, if you eat 100 grams of protein, roughly 60% of that will be converted to glucose, depending on gluconeogenesis and some of these other factors. But you don't need carbohydrates. If you are going to increase carbohydrates in your, day, in your diet, you have to earn it. And there is a meal threshold. So you guys can take a picture, 40, 55, 40 grams or less to minimize an insulin response. Greater than 40 grams is associated with exercise recovery. So to wrap it all up, I know I just have a few more minutes. Muscle health is everything. And if we get that right, we can refocus this idea that muscle is medicine. And then we don't have to look everywhere else for these answers and these new drugs. 50% of Americans aren't working out. 70% are overweight or obese. The changes start now. And I have to tell you, we are absolutely, I know it's funny. <laughs> I am full of mom jokes up here. But here's the thing. We are at a crossroad. And the way I see it is this is a crossroad. This is a crossroad. And here's what it comes down to. We live in the land of the friggin' free and the home of the brave, and now the strong. And you know what? It's up to us. It's up to you guys as the messengers to understand that this movement of muscle-centric medicine it depends on you, and that's what has to move forward. Thank you.